home. We present the first of a new twice-weekly series of plays, based on the short stories of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, dramatized by Michael Hardwick, with Carlton Hobbs as Sherlock Holmes and Norman Shelley as Dr. Watson. And now, here is Dr. Watson to introduce the case of The Dancing Man. Uh, thank you, sir. <clears throat> I have told elsewhere of the joyful return of my friend, Mr. Sherlock Holmes, three years after his supposed death struggle with the late Professor Moriarty at the Reichenbach Falls. After his restless wanderings in the East and on the continent, he seemed content to be at anchor once more in the haven of our former lodging at 221B Baker Street, where our landlady, Mrs. Hudson, proceeded as usual to spoil him while continuing to deplore his irregular and untidy habits. But it was not long before he had become absorbed again in his practice as a consulting detective, ready for any investigation that gave promise of stretching his remarkable powers to their limits. <laughs> I see him now, one morning, sitting in silence, his long, thin back, curved over a chemical vessel, in which he was brewing a particularly malodorous product. His head was sunk upon his breast. <laughs> he looked, from my point of view, like a strange, lank bird with dull gray plumage and a black top knot. Oh, Watson, you do not propose to invest in South African securities. Hey, Holmes, why on earth do you know that? Confess yourself utterly taken aback. I am. I ought to make you sign a paper to that event. Why? Because in five minutes you'll say it's all so absurdly simple, Holmes. I shall say nothing of the kind. We shall see. <laughs> there, that's done. Now, Watson. You've heard me remark before that it is not difficult to construct a series of inferences, each dependent upon its predecessor and each simple in itself. Frequently. If after doing so, one simply knocks out all the central inferences and presents one's audience with the starting point of the conclusion, one may produce a startling, though possibly a meretricious effect. So I don't quite see what all this is about. Now, it was not really difficult by an inspection of the grooves between your left forefinger and thumb, to feel sure you did not propose to invest your small capital in the gold field. What thing I don't see any connection. When you returned from the club last night, you had chalk between your left forefinger and thumb. Well, what are it? I put it there to steady me cue. You never played billiards except with Thurston. Now, you told me four weeks ago that Thurston had an option on some South African property which would expire in a month and which he desired you to share with him. Ah. Yet your checkbook is locked in my drawer and you haven't asked for the key. Mm -hmm. Therefore, my dear Watson, you do not propose to invest your money in this manner. That's <laughs> simple, Holmes. Quite so. <laughs> Every problem becomes very childish once it's explained to you. Well, here's an unexplained one on this piece of paper. So what do you make of that? What on earth is it? Looks like a row of little men. Uh, one or two of them waving his flag, you see. Looks very especially dancing. <laughs> Childish, all right, Holmes. It's a child's drawing of a line of dancing men. Childish enough to have terrified a young woman half out of her wit. And to bring her husband post haste all the way from Norfolk to consult me. I fancy that's him on our stair now. Come in. Mr. Pugit, sir. Thank you, Mrs. Hudson. Mr. Holmes? I am Holmes. This is my friend and colleague, Dr. Watson. Oh, uh, how do you do, gentlemen? How do you do, Mr. Pugit? Sit here. Uh, thank you. Ah. I see you have my dancing men there. What do you make of them, Mr. Holmes? At first sight, a childish prank. Prank? You have my letter, Mr. Holmes. I tell you, it's frightening my wife to death. So I understand. I think for my friend's benefit, you'd better have your whole story from the beginning, Mr. Pugh. Well, I'm not much of a story, dearly, you know. A countryman born and bred. There's no family better known than the Cubits in the whole of Norfolk. 
acquired a bridling for five centuries. Quite so. And I understand that you'd remained a bachelor until only recently. That's right. I came up to London for the Golden Jubilee last year. I met a young American woman, Elsie Patrick. I stayed in my boarding house. Well, to cut a long story short, before the month was up, I was as much in love as a man could be. Married her at the registry office and uh, took her back to Wiggling Court. Congratulations. Well, uh, some thought I was mad, I don't doubt. A man of good old family taking a wife, an American as that, without knowing a blessed thing about her family or her past. But if you saw her, you'd understand why I did it. Did she tell you nothing about her background? Oh, yes. Yes, she said, I beg you never to ask about my past. But you take me, Elton, she says. You take a woman who has done nothing that she need personally be ashamed of. But you'll have to be content with my word for it. If you can't, then go back to Norfolk and forget all about me. That was very straightforward. Well, there was no going back for me. I took her on those terms. That was just a year ago. We've been very happy. Blissfully. Until just the other morning, we were coming back from an early morning ride. Hunt, he's the stable lad, took our horses and Elsie ran on ahead into the house. I'll telephone this breakfast in ten minutes, darling. Right, Earl. Ah, good boy. Let's get him for a month. You can take him now, Hunt. I sir. What are all these chalk marks? Come here. Nothing to do with me, sir. But you don't suppose the mistress or I go around chalking? Hmm. What are they? Sort of little men dancing. You don't suppose we go around chalking such things on window ledges, do you? Not me, sir. Or Saunders or Cook. Oh, come on now. I can't eat you for it. It wasn't me. Oh, very well. Only get it rubbed off. And I don't want to see any more of it, do you understand? Thanks. Ah. Pretty young goat. Hello, me. No, darling, not you. Um, <laughs> Drink your coffee. Thanks. No, that young hunt. No, he's not all that bright, too. I guess like a liar. Is that what he is? Talking rubbish on a willy leg. Rude rubbish? Well, some sort of scribble. Little men sort of dancing about. <gasps> Idling his time. A little chalk in his hand, I suppose. Uh, but uh, on the house, it's too bad. Oh! Darling! Saunders! Saunders, quick! The mistress is fainting. She didn't uh, injure herself, I hope? No. No, she was round again in a few moments. Tried to make out of just a disease spell. And that long gallop on an empty stomach, you know. Yes. I was able to go on with her breakfast, and I didn't think much more about it. But after the second time... The following morning, I believe. Uh, yesterday, Mr. Holmes. Uh, uh, just after breakfast this time. Went out for a little stroll in the garden together. Quite a again. Until we reached the sundial. That's where we found this paper I sent you. The second lot of dancing men, or whatever you call them. I picked it up and showed it her without thinking. Thought she was going to change away again on the spot. Great heavens. Mr. Cubitt, these dancing men you found on the sundial, can you possibly say whether the drawing is the same as the one you saw on the windowsill? That crossed my mind in the train, but I, I can't say. Only took a glance at the first lot, you know. Oh, understandably. Tell me, have you heard of any strangers in your neighborhood lately? Uh, strangers? Don't think so. I presume it's a very quiet place. Any fresh face would cause comment. Oh, bonjour. Then I suggest you return to Norfolk. But can't you advise me then? I am doing so. 
Go home, take an exact copy of any fresh dancing men that may appear, and make discreet inquiries as to any strangers in the neighborhood. Do you reckon these drawings add up to something? Evidently. If their meaning is purely arbitrary, then it may be impossible for us to solve it. On the other hand, if it's systematic, I have no doubt we shall get to the bottom of it. Oh, good day, Mr. Cubitt. If there are any fresh developments, I shall always be ready to run down and see you in Norfolk. If that's your advice, Mr. Holmes, then... Well, good day, gentlemen. Good day. Ah, Mr. Cubitt. Come in, won't you? Thank you, Dr. Watson. Mr. Holmes, I'm sorry to return like this in less than a week, but this business is getting on my nerves. Have there been further events? There certainly have. Look, look at these. Three more sets of these figures. Thank you. Ah. All different, Holmes. Excellent. Excellent. Great, and there's everything in order, Mr. Hugh. Well, when I got back to Riddlingthorpe after seeing you the other day, the first thing I saw was a fresh crop of dancing men flopped on the stable door. That was this one. Did you rub out the mask after copying them? Certainly. Didn't want else to see them. But two mornings later, there was this fresh inscription in their place. Capital. Our material is really accumulated. Uh, three days later, a message was left. Called on paper on the sundial again. Uh, this one. I reckon all this work was being done by night. So last night, I determined to sit up in my study. In the dark. With a revolver in my hand. Well, it was about two in the morning. Nothing had happened. So when I heard the study door opening quietly behind me. What are you doing? Why, you're fully dressed. And a gun. What are you doing, more likely? Uh, I guess I couldn't sleep. I, I came to look for a book. Without bringing a light? There's the moon. Now, see here, Elsie. This has gone far enough. If you do... Ah! What is it? What are you looking at? By heavens, there's someone out there. Isn't there? No. No, there's no one. I just saw... There's somebody there. Well, I'm going to get him and we'll have this out. Oh, no, you mustn't. Get out of my way, please. I won't. Oh, yes, you will. Oh, you're so yes. good. I won't let you. Oh. Take go of me. For heaven's sake, I'm at your own goal. No, darling, I know, but I won't let you go. Do you hear me? I shan't let you go. She held on to me for all she was worth. At last I got clear, but... By the time I got outside, there was no one to be seen. She said she'd stop me going out because I might come to some harm. But for a moment, I thought the truth was that she was afraid of him coming to some harm. To me. By God, he would have done. Is that what you believe? Uh, no, Mr. Holmes. There's a tone in my wife's voice and a look in her eyes which forbids doubt. And I'm sure that it was indeed my own safety that she had in her mind. How long can you stay in London? I must be going now. Wouldn't leave Elsie alone there at night for anything. Neither would I in your place. If you could have stopped, I might possibly have been able to return to Norfolk with you in a day or two. But I must apply myself to these singular pieces of paper for some while. I think it's very likely that I shall then be able to pay you a visit and throw some light upon your most interesting case. Holmes, it says here in the paper... Please, Watson. Oh, sorry, sorry, I forgot. Thank you, Dr. Watson. Now, if Mr. Holmes will kindly let me have the table... Oh, no, leave him. What again? But he hasn't eaten since yesterday. I know, I know. Tell you what. I'll come down to the kitchen and eat mine there. But, Dr. Watson... After you... Watson. Watson. May I... Oh, Holmes, well, 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 what is it? Is there a train to North Walsham tonight? I'll look for you. Um, what might you be? Wednesday, of course. Oh, I just wondered. You've been working two days on those messy drawings. 
Sign seems to mean so little. It might have been Thursday by now. Please, Watson. Uh, yes, here we are, North Watson. What time? Huh? No, the last one just left. Confound it. If only this new letter from Cupid had arrived sooner this evening, we could have caught that train. This affair has gone far enough. More dancing men? You, you found something then? That our presence is most urgently needed. Yes, Mrs. Hudson? Is that an answer to my cable, then? It is, sir. The boy's waiting if you should wish to reply. Well, I uh, very much doubt if it should be... Ah, uh, Watson, mm-hmm. this set of that we must get there without delay. What is this in danger? I fear, sir. Well, why not warn them by telegram, the, the, the boys? No, 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 the place is too remote. It won't be delivered tonight. Our only hope is to take the very first train in the morning. Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock? Who? Oh, Martin, sir. Inspector Martin. Marple Constabulary. How'd you do? What? How could you have heard? I mean, the crime was only committed at three o'clock this morning. But what happened, Inspector? Quickly, please. Shot. Both of them. Oh, no. Mr. and Mrs. He's dead and she's... No. Oh, no. I anticipated the crime. I came in the hope of preventing it. You did? Then you mean you've got some evidence? I have. The evidence for the dancing men. The dancing? Inspector Martin. Will you associate me in your investigation, or would you prefer me to act independently? Why, I'd be very proud to feel I was working with you, Mr. Holmes. In that case, I should be glad to examine the house and hear the evidence without further delay. Well, no. The body's in the study, just as it was found. Mrs. Cooper's been taken upstairs, and the doctor's with her. But we don't hold out much hope, I hear. Well, if you'll follow me, gentlemen. Well, the question seems to be, did he shoot her, and then himself... Or did she shoot him and try to do away with herself? Uh, he was lying here, dead, just as you see him. And she was over near the window, where you see all that blood. The revolver lay about midway between them. It was the only revolver in the room? Yes. Two chambers had been fired, and the window is shut. Is that how it was found? Yes, sir. Mrs. King, the cook, will depose to all that. Yes, sir. Definitely two shots I heard. One louder. Which was the ladder, Mrs. King? The first. It must have been so woke me. Might what you heard have been two shots fired simultaneously, followed by a single shot which sounded much less loud by comparison? Oh, so I couldn't say it to that, sir. No, 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 quite. Uh, what did you do? Oh, I come downstairs. Were any lights on? I brought the candle. But how did you know which room to approach? By the smell. Smell? No one said anything to me about the smell. The smoke from the gun. As soon as I reached the hall, I could smell it, coming from the study. So I went in. Was the door open? A bit. I went in, and and there they was. The poor master and mistress lying. Try not to upset yourself, Mrs. King. Mrs. King, only one more question. Yes, sir. Was there no light in the study when you entered? Only the candle. The one you were carrying? And the other one, on the table near the window. Now, madam, you say there was a candle burning close to the window. Was the window open or shut? Shut, sir. You didn't shut it yourself? No, sir. I touched nothing. The candle stood here, then, and the window was shut. I don't quite see the significance of it, Holmes. Nor do I, Doctor. Here we have a revolver with two shots fired, one bullet in Kirby's heart, and the other lies near to his wife's brain. The only question is... How do you account for the bullet which so obviously struck the bottom of the window frame here? Me? Where? Why, George, Mr. Holmes. However, however did you come to see that? Because I looked for it. Then three shots were fired, and only two of them from this revolver. So, Mr. you mean to say there was a third person? Undoubtedly. Mrs. King's evidence told me that. But how on earth... She smelt cordite fumes as she came down into the hall. Some draft from in here must have been necessary to blow them from the room so quickly. The window must have been opened for a time. 
though not long enough to extinguish the candle. As I conceded, a third person stood outside the window and fired in. A shot was fired at him and struck the bottom of the window pane. Then who shot the window? Mrs. Cubitt. But she was... A woman's instinct, Inspector. Shots were fired. She sprang to the window and shut it for protection. What? But I... Hello? What's this? That? Who? Her handbag. Found lying near her. No message or anything. But plenty of cash. So I see. Yes. Twenty fifty pound notes. A thousand pounds? It must be preserved as it is. It will figure in the trial. What do you make of it, sir? Now, there are several points of this problem which I've not been able to explain to you yet, and this must remain one of them. But we must act quickly. How, oh, sir? Firstly, by searching the flower bed outside this window, where I have no doubt we shall find the spent case of the third cartridge. And then? Mr. Martin, is there any inn in this neighborhood known as Eldridge's? Eldridge's? Uh, Eldridge's. No, I can't. Hold on. There's an Eldridge's farm. Over to East Ruston. Is that a lonely path? Oh, very, sir. Ah, then perhaps they'll not yet have heard of all that happened here during the night. Very likely not, not sir. Capital. Now, will you have the goodness to instruct one of the stable lads to saddle a horse and go there at once with a message which I shall give him? Well, I don't see you. Now, Watson, a piece of paper from that bureau, please. All right. There you are. Thank you. Now, then... Abe Slaney? Eldridge's farm? Holmes, who's Abe Slaney? You'll find out soon enough. And, uh, Inspector, mm -hmm. I think you'd do well to telegraph for an escort. As you may have to convey a particularly dangerous prisoner to the county jail. Oh, really? The boy... Who takes this note could no doubt forward your telegram. <laughs> As you see, Watson, this uh, this is not my usual form of communication. Johnson, then. Now, Holmes, what the... I thought we'd wait in this morning room because it has a very pleasant view of the drive. Oh, it's very pretty, I'm sure. Only Make I... yourself comfortable, gentlemen. And while we await the outcome of my dispatch to East Ruston, I think I can help you to pass the time in an interesting and profitable manner. Well, to you, friend Watson, I owe every atonement for having allowed your natural curiosity to remain so long unsatisfied. Thank you, To so, Mr. Martin, the whole incident may appeal as a remarkable professional study. Uh, remarkable is the word, eh, Doctor? <laughs> <laughs> I am fairly familiar with all forms of secret writing, and I am myself the author of a trifling monograph upon the subject in which I analyze 160 separate ciphers. But the use of these dancing men is entirely new to me and has been invented, apparently, to conceal that a message is being conveyed by giving the impression of random sketches by some child. I see. Now, as you are aware, E is the most common letter in the English alphabet. The figure most common in all these troops of dancing men was this little fellow with legs apart and left arm upraised. Operatic tenor taking a high C. <laughs> Very good, Watson. Only it's an E in this case. <laughs> <laughs> now, speaking roughly, the order in which the other letters of the English alphabet tend to predominate is T, A, O, I, N, S. And so I had two messages complete, the first of which read, and here, Abe Slaney at Elridge's. Now, I had every reason to suppose that this Slaney was an American. Well, how is that, Holmes? Abe is an American contraction. Mrs. Cubitt's American origin and her reticence about her past suggested that there was some criminal secret involved. I therefore cabled to the New York Police Bureau asking whether the name of Abe Slaney was known to them and received the reply, Abe Slaney, the most dangerous crook in Chicago. Why, George? On the very evening this answer arrived, Cubitt sent me the last of his dancing men messages. It read, Elsie, prepare to meet thy God. I knew there wasn't a moment to lose. Unfortunately, Watson, we did lose our moment and reached here to find that the worst had already occurred. Yes. Hello. Who's this? 
If I'm not mistaken, Abe Slaney. What? What's he doing here? I invited him. Well, he doesn't know it, does I? Hmm. Powerful looking gentleman, isn't he? Hmm. I've given instructions that he's to be directed immediately to this room. So, I suggest we take our positions behind the door. You'll need your handcuffs, Inspector. Very good. But you can leave the talking to me. Take him. What? Right. What the... Come on here. Okay. Okay. So somebody got the drop on each lady at last. But who are you guys? Where's Elsie? He's in his chair with him. Mrs. Hilton Kilbert is seriously wounded. What? She may die. Are you crazy? He shot at me and I shot at him. If you think I'd have touched the hair of Elsie's head, she was mine. Who did this cubic guy think he was taking her away from me? He did not take her. Huh? She broke away from our country and you when she discovered the kind of man you are. Uh, but you had to dog her steps to England and threaten her. Well, Sadie, you caused the death of an innocent man and driven his wife to attempt suicide. Suicide? Oh, uh, <laughs> Now I know you're crazy. Say, if she's hurt so bad, how did she write this? Telling me to get over here first. Huh? I wrote it. <laughs> Look, Elsie's poor old Patrick invented this dancing man code, and nobody outside the gang knew it. What one man can invent, another can discover. Her father was in the gang with you, you say? Sure, he was the boss. Now you know what's in her past, eh? I also know that she expected you to come here last night and had a thousand pounds ready to offer you if you'd leave her and her husband in peace. Eh? But he was waiting here, too. Wasn't he, Slaney? Look, it, it, it was self-defense, I tell you. He shot at me first and hit the window frame. You shot back through the open window simultaneously and killed him. A servant thought both shots were one. You fled. Mrs. Cubitt sprang to the window and shut it, then picked up her husband's gun and turned it on herself. From remorse, I dare say, for bringing him to his death. If she recovers, she may yet have to face the charge of murdering her husband. What? The least that you owe her is to make it clear to the whole world that she was in no way directly or indirectly responsible for his tragic end. Okay. I ask nothing better. I guess you fellas are cops. All right, you can take me. I won't try anything. I guess I've done enough. I'll bring in a couple of my constables then. Mr. Holmes, I only hope if ever I have an important case again, I'll have the good fortune to have you by my side. Thank you, Inspector. The credit shall be yours. For myself, there has been the satisfaction of a singular inquiry. As to my friend Watson, <laughs> Holmes, I think that I provided you with something unusual for your notebook. Yes, indeed. <laughs> then come along. Three forty is our train. I fancy we should be back in Baker Street in time for dinner. The Dancing Man by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle was adapted for radio by Michael Hardwick. The part of Sherlock Holmes was played by Carlton Hobbs and Dr. Watson by Norman Shelley. Hilton Cubitt, Humphrey Morton, Elsie Cubitt, Anne Murray. Mrs. Hudson, Janet Morrison, Inspector Martin, Fred Yule, Mrs. King, Janet Hitchman, Abe Slaney, John Bentley, Hunt, John Gray. The production was by Graham Gould. The next play in this series, A Case of Identity, can be heard at 8.15 on Thursday on Radio 2. <laughs>